I'm Kristen Daly. I'm the executive director of Global Washington, your host here today. And uh, if you don't know, Global Washington is a network of 165 nonprofit and for-profit organizations that have a presence in Washington State and do work to improve lives in developing countries. So with 165 members, you can imagine they do everything from clean water, to climate change, to global health, to economic development. So the way Global Washington organizes our work is that we pick one topic each month and do a deep dive. We do our issue campaign to elevate our members and the work that they do. So this month, we are looking at clean water. And then what we do is we ask our members. We say, what's relevant? What's important right now in clean water? So in talking, we started with Kirk and Marla um, from Water First, and it's actually continued from our conference last year that Cindy was a part of with Clean Water. We really looked at um, the issue that nonprofits aren't very comfortable about talking about failure. And in part because they think maybe that doesn't make the nonprofit look good. That the funders are expecting the activities to succeed, so we need to say, well, they mostly succeeded. And we thought that was interesting because in business, failure is actually accepted. And failure is what you do to iterate and create better products. But in the nonprofit field, that's not necessarily the case. So we decided to look at that topic a little more in detail around clean water and really looking at clean water systems, products, and um, approaches to see what we could learn from each other and what we can learn from the for-profit world in this and around the partnership. So that's what today is all about. And then we found out that we have a very special guest here today. Serena Pravazzi is the CEO of Water Aid, and she's actually based in New York City and is in town in Seattle. So we are going to start the program with a few special remarks from Serena. And you have her bio in your program at this seat, and you'll have the bio of all the panelists, so I'll just do a very brief introduction of each. But first, uh, I'll have Serena speak. She's CEO of Water Aid. She's been in international development for 20 years, a ton of experience, um, and representing Water, Water Aid in Ethiopia and has traveled extensively and lived abroad. She's originally from Nepal. And um, now I just found out she just wrote a book which is probably not in her bio, actually, um, specifically in coffee and the coffee industry, in, in Ethiopia, specifically? Ethiopia, so, New York. In New York. So, fascinating story, which I don't know if she's going to, she's not giving a book talk here today, she's going to talk about world water aid, but just an aside to look her up. So, Serena, would you come on up? Thank you so much. Uh, so delighted to be here. Um, thank you to Global Washington for having me, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, as Kristen said, I'm Serena Pravasi. I'm the CEO of WaterAid in the U.S. Uh, WaterAid is a global federation, um, and, and I run the U.S. part. Uh, Elena, my colleague, is there in the red shirt. She is uh, local, Seattle area based. Um, and WaterAid, for those of you who, I'll just do a very quick uh, intro for water aid. We focus on water, sanitation, and hygiene. We do all three because we believe that the three together really have the best outcomes for what we're looking for in terms of well-being, health, etc. Um, and the organization has been around since 1981. So there's been plenty of time for failure and uh, that's the topic of today. It's a brave topic, I have to agree, because uh, it's really tough to talk about failure publicly in nonprofits. And we do, we do sort of lesson learning and evaluation um, privately. We do that a lot. Um, at, but really openly, externally, publicly speaking about failure is something I think that is much newer. Um, and in my opinion, a very welcome move in the sector, because unless we get over our embarrassment and feeling of discomfort and shame. A lot of the things that we try to get over when we talk about sanitation and hygiene, actually, um, we can apply to ourselves in, in how we're talking about failure. And because really, unless we look at these things, we're never going to get better. We're never going to improve. And, um, and, and I think that you know, in terms of where we are in the world of water, sanitation, hygiene, we have a lot to be proud of. We've made a lot of progress in the last 
um, many years, and a lot of times the numbers are quoted, 1.5 billion people reached with water um, since the year 2000, or between 2000 and 2015. Um, equally very impressive numbers uh, on sanitation. But, um, you know, there's, while we can be proud of what we've been doing, there is so much more. And as we're doing, so much is being undone behind us. And uh, one of the really shocking statistics in our sector is about the failure rate of new investments. So um, when I worked in Ethiopia, that's really when I got my ground tra level training in water sanitation. And most of the stakeholders we worked with, most of our funding partners, donors, everybody wanted to fund new work, new, new construction. And they wanted to be able to claim that new work and those new results and this many people this many hundreds or thousands of people reached. But as we were building new things behind us, and not only us as WaterAid, but the whole sector is leaving a trail of um, non-functioning or poorly functioning. So part of when we think about um, these people reached, what kind of service are we providing? Um, is it a regular service? Is it, is it a reliable service? Is the water that is being provided safe to drink? And I think those are really hard questions when you dig deeper. And it's much easier to tell the stories of, you know, sort of the smiling families and look at how much better. And, and it's, all of that is true. All of that is true, but there's also other things that are true. Like sometimes the water from the water point is not safe. Sometimes uh, the water point, the focus on the water point itself is misguided because like any service that we rely on, any good service in your life, um, it's not just that point. Of, there's a whole system behind it. And I think our sector is starting to talk about systems, um, starting to, you know, but systems are notoriously difficult and they're complicated and they're not all at the water point. They're not all in our comfort zone. They involve stepping out beyond the things that we've traditionally been doing. So I think that's a big um, sort of a call to all of us to be really, mindful um, as we're talking about our failures and the things that we're learning, we're learning in sort of a microcosm, but we're also connected to a much bigger system of governance, of accountability, of you know what the, whether it's the district or whose responsibility is what, um, how far our own responsibility as nonprofits go. Um, at WaterAid, we have something that we started many years ago called looking back studies, and those were studies that we did 5, 10, 15 years after uh, something had been built. And that was for us really the starting point of learning about when something's not working, why is it not working? And only in a small percentage of cases was it not working because of the technology. In many, many cases it was something else was not working. And so that really was the entry point to thinking about systems and all the different things that it takes to keep a reliable, safe water supply system uh, going. So, um, and then, you know, I don't want to be overly pessimistic, <laughs> pessimistic because, as I say, I really do, I feel very proud of a lot of the work that all of us as a sector together are doing. But I think that um, with the changes uh, coming, and, you know, we have a huge challenge in front of us with climate change, which is going to be experienced by most, uh, most immediately and most terribly by the people that we are serving, the people that are really on the front lines. And whether it's too much water or too little water, I think most people in the room are very familiar with these issues. So, um, but I don't, as, as a sector, I don't think we've really come to grapple with that. And maybe not just as a sector, as a world, I don't think we fully uh, grappled with that, and I think we see that a lot now in our, in the public sphere, uh, with a lot of the younger folks telling us, "Hey, you know, it's time for more urgency." And I think that in our sector too, really thinking about if we want smart, sustainable services, um, that just became harder for us to deliver. Um, so I think that just much more collaboration. And in Wash, we always talk about collaboration, but I think it's now really more important than ever that we are uh, collaborating and it's not an optional, it's not optional anymore. Um, so those are just some remarks from me. Um, I really thank you for 
inviting me here, and it's really a pleasure to be here. And since you did mention the book, <laughs> um, I'll take my cue. I have a panel event tonight at the Riveter. I think some of you uh, have mentioned that you've heard about that. Um, and it's a panel discussion with some local Seattle businesses and myself, and we're talking about coffee, but also the panel is titled More Than Just Coffee. So it's really about community and community building and the role of business um, and small businesses in that. So you're very welcome. And if I know it's short notice, so if you can't come, please look it up, or um, I'd be happy to be in touch afterwards. Thank you so much for having me. Now we're going to have uh, our conversation with our panelists, so I'll invite the panelists to come on up. And then after we have uh, questions that I will moderate with the panel, we'll open it up for questions from the audience, so you can think about your questions as we talk. Um, so again, you have their bios uh, printed in your program here, but I will just do brief highlights. First, uh, in the middle, we have Kirk Anderson who's the Director of International Programs from Water First. And he's been at Water First for the past 12 years. And he supports programs right now in Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Honduras, and Mozambique. And he's actually in charge of the monitoring and evaluation, which will be very important for this conversation. Uh, he was in the Peace Corps, he was a Peace Corps volunteer in Lesotho, and also a graduate of the Georgia Institute of Technology with an MS in Public Policy. So, Great mix of background for this conversation, so welcome to uh, Next we have Cindy Bird, who is the Director of Business Development at Splash, and she has nearly 20 years of experience in international development, and right now she's working specifically on a consortium for Splash that's a $44 million consortium that's going to work with governments and schools in Addis and Kolkata specifically in a project that is uh, sought to benefit one million children. Splash does not think small. <laughs> so, uh, and Cindy is a great leader within Splash to really help that vision come, to, come about. So welcome, Cindy. And we have Patrick Dillard, and he's from MSR Global Health. And if you don't know, MSR is Mountain Safety Research it's the, the company that brought you the Thermarest. They do outdoor equipment, and MSR Global Health was established how many years ago? 2015. MSR, but then the Global Health. Global Health was 2015 MSR. 2015. Celebrating our 50th year. Yeah. So um, MSR Global Health is a new aspect because the, the engineers and others, the leadership within MSR for the outdoor equipment realized we have these amazing products that are really good in low resource settings. Why don't we see how we can apply these to developing countries? Um, and I'm sure, sure Patrick will get into this, but it's just fascinating. It's fantastic that a for-profit company can think that boldly and establish a whole division and pull in R&D and all other aspects um, of their company to do that. So Patrick's here representing kind of the private sector, but they also partner with PACT and others to, to get their work done. So. Um, they're a great partner in our community as well. Um, Patrick himself, previous, uh, his previous position was uh, six years at Whole Foods Market, where he was in charge of partnerships with uh, the community as well. So he's all about the intersection between private sector and nonprofit. So um, welcome, Patrick. So let's get started in our questions. So we, as I mentioned, we named this Failing Fast Forward, and we want to just open the conversation with each of the panelists telling us why you think it's important for an organization to acknowledge failure or address failure within your own organization. Uh, Cindy, would you like to start? Sure thing. Thank you so much. So yeah, Cindy Berg, Director of Business Development at Slash, and I would say we don't just learn from failure or tolerate failure, but we embrace it and really consider it an integral part of how we do business. And pretty much everything that we've learned and where we are today is the result of many, many failures. So I wanted to give you a walk through, tell you a little bit more about Splash. I've got five minutes, probably 4.30 right now. And um, through that, show you some of the failures that have brought us to where we are today. So hope those slides will work. That's Splash. I was trying to think of a way to show all the different things that we do and what we do now. So 
Our tagline has been for several years, we clean water for kids. Pretty simple, right? And Splash is different because we're focused in cities. So a lot of WASH organizations are focused in rural areas. But we know that by 2050, 70% of the world will live in cities. And we need to be there ahead of them and get it ready. Um, we have a footprint in eight countries. And you'll see that that's evolved quite a lot. Um, and our goal has always been 100% coverage of a given geography. So take a city, for example reaching every single school in a city, or every single orphanage in China, which is something we achieved after 10 years of learning um, at the end of 2017. And so we used to have a much broader footprint. We worked in orphanages, schools, hospitals, shelters, um, et cetera. And now we're really focused on schools, but we'll get there soon. And while we started as a clean water organization, we now cover water, hygiene, sanitation, Behavior change, which is like the cousin to hygiene, how do you actually get people to adopt hygienic behaviors? Um, and now our newest focus is menstrual health. So just to show you a few examples of failures and what we've learned. So with water filtration, we learned very quickly, um, tried out a bunch of different methodologies, and settled on ultrafiltration. And this is just an image of an ultrafiltration system. It looks very different if you see the real thing, but basic, basic ideas. We learned we needed to buy commercial grade equipment. So we actually partnered with a manufacturer based in the US called Antunis, and they supply McDonald's. So they make sure that at any McDonald's around the world, the water being served and the food being cooked is, is clean. It's made from clean water. Um, we learned that through trial and error. And lastly, we learned that we need to develop local supply chains, because if you import something from the US or China to Ethiopia or India, and it breaks, no one can fix it unless there's a spare part. So major learnings there. How else have we failed? We have failed through the um, creation of hand washing and drinking water stations. So we work with kids, right? So you need a place to access the water. Um, if you go to a lot of schools in low resource countries, there's literally a tap that gets turned on. Maybe there's one tap for 500 kids. It's You can't always get to the tap. There's one line and it's just not good. So we develop these hand washing and drinking water stations. But we started in concrete, then we went to tile, then we went to fiberglass, and now we have developed these new mass manufactured and recycled plastic drinking and hand washing stations. And they're really cool. Um, there's a 3D print over there if you want to take a look later. But basically they incorporate behavioral nudges, they're lightweight, they're transportable, they're cost effective. Um, Look at all those features, super exciting. <laughs> but really, we, we failed for 10 years, people. That's a long time <laughs> to come up with this, and now we think we have the solution. Sanitation, another area of failure. Uh, we didn't start sanitation until 2015, and with the help of two donors, we started to pilot what would it look like if we started to tackle sanitation in schools. We're talking toilets and urinals, very fun. And Rotary um, International, actually, helped us um, start that pilot work. And we learned very quickly, initially we had bought you know, what we thought was cost effective, um, and then we found out it just wasn't durable, it wasn't high quality. We were gonna have to spend more, and we were gonna have to charge donors more. Um, second, we found out that if you rehabilitate a bunch of toilets, but you actually still don't have enough toilets for the whole school, um, the toilets you rehabilitated will degrade very quickly. So you really need to focus on ratios. Um, those were a couple of key learnings. So basically we learned that we need to spend more to ensure sustainability. We need ratios for toilets. And then this is just a quick picture of like before and after. So a lot of these are failures from the wash sector. Maybe a couple of them are our failures. And then this is like, of course, the beautiful picture we all want to see is shiny um, products that last and work. But of course, the infrastructure is just one part of it, and actually the, probably the easiest part, as many challenges as we had getting it right, where we were really focused over the last few years is figuring out behavior change. So you've got to teach kids to wash their hands. You've got to convince somebody to put that bar of soap at the soap washing station after kids steals it. You've <laughs> got to train somebody to take care of the equipment and make sure that it's maintained properly. And this is my last slide. I love slides. Um, this is our model of a school implementation at this point. And you can see, apparently this does, oh yeah. 
this is really, I, this is what Splash used to consider our implementation. We're doing water, we're doing hygiene, we're doing sanitation, we're done. And now look, that's just one third of all that we're doing. There's so much work on the front end to make sure the school's committed and that they are gonna continue this program for the long term, but they really want what we're doing. And then at the back end, making sure that there's training on sustainability, that there's regular maintenance, and that there's monitoring. So all of that is driven from failure. Um, I'm gonna talk later about systems change because I think that's an exciting topic too, but for now, this is kind of like the hardware software focus. Thanks. That's great, thank you, Cindy. And um, this is all of, all of this is really important. Also at your seat, you'll see our issue brief. And just to highlight Cindy's emphasis on the pre and the post and the implementation, the statistic in there that says 30 to 50% of water projects fail within the first few years. 30 to 50%. And again, maybe in the for-profit sector that's acceptable and we iterate and we learn, but this is something that nonprofits are looking at saying, how, and we have to learn from that. And we have to figure out how to talk about that, how do we learn from that, and how do we figure out the post-implementation so that doesn't happen. So we've got some great experts here to help us through this. So Kirk, why is talking about failure important to Water First? All right, um, so, so there, are, there are really two different kinds of failure, I think. There's, you know, capital, all capital letters failure, and, um, and that's in 1980, in this sector, the failure rate was 30 to 50 percent after a couple years, and then in 2010, the failure rate was 30 to 50 after a couple years. So that's 30 years of no improvement, and that's capital F failure. Um, and that means that you're not even looking to see what your projects are doing, um, and, and you're not modifying your behavior. So for some reason, there hasn't been enough behavior modification in the sector. Um, and, and then there's the, the failure in, in small letters, which is uh, those organizations that are looking at their projects, they're monitoring, they're, they have a set of standards that they apply, like is the soap still there at, at the hand washing station? How much water are people using? Um, and, and measuring your, your uh, outcomes against those standards and then seeing where you didn't meet those standards and making adjustments. So um, not enough of us organizations are doing that. And, and the question is, well, why is that? Why, you know, how does that happen? And, and, um, and we think one of the answers is that, that the people who are buying the product aren't using the product. That, uh, funders give money to organizations and then someone else uses the end product. So there isn't a feedback loop like there would be if you bought a car and that car stinks and so you go, the car company goes out of business. Um, so there are groups that aren't going out of business and, and because they're not, they're not sort of punished uh, financially for for not improving. So when, um, and we don't do projects, we select partner organizations who do projects, which is an idea that we stole from Watery. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so one question that we ask partner organizations before we pick a partner is, what have you changed in the last two years with your program? Because if they haven't changed anything, then they probably haven't looked. Um, so that's a question that we think funders should ask us, and funders should ask anyone that they fund. Hey, so what have you changed in the last two years with your programming? And if you don't hear anything back, then, then you need to wonder, am I funding one of these groups that's not learning, that's not monitoring, and that's not adapting? And it's, and it's for the benefit of the world's poor, so you know, that's a, an important step to take for funders. So we encourage people to ask that question. Really good. Uh, I, I like how you phrase that in terms of what have you changed in the past two years. It's a great question. 
Uh, Patrick, so from your perspective, and you've been kind of recent into the global development field, why do you think it's important to talk about failure within MSR? Uh, yeah, no, it's a great question. I think, well, first, I, I failed today to bring slides, so <laughs> <laughs> um, But if I did, <laughs> I did, I did learn, yes. <laughs> if, if I did, um, they would, you know, I would have a few images that are kind of iconic MSR images of, of people in mountains and showing that we, um, we really focus on failure because when our products fail, they put real lives at risk. And we've learned that both in the outdoor community and also now in global health or with our military work. And so for us, we, um, we can't accept failure at any rate once we have a product that we've put out there to the world. Um, before that, we thrive on failure. We push everything to its breaking point um, to learn every possible place and point of failure that can happen. Um, and so that's, you know, it's a huge part of our culture as a, as a for-profit company, as a product development company. Um, but I think it's really been interesting for us in this space um, we started in this kind of what we call our, the global health space because of failure. We had a product that we thought was going to help out a lot of people during a disaster. We sent a ton of it. It was the biggest philanthropic thing we'd ever done in our company's history. Uh, and it was a massive failure because people didn't understand how to use the product. We didn't have the resources there to train people. People couldn't read the instructions. It was just, it was a, it was a mess. And, that's what got us to thinking about how can we do this better. And so I think you know, failure for a company like us is extremely important to happen, to understand, and to really reflect on. Um, and I think we're also learning that it goes beyond just the product. There's all these other pieces that now that we have a product that need to happen to get it to those beneficiaries. And so there's tons of failures that have happened and I'm sure will continue to happen. To, to reach those people, but it's important for us to step back and continually look at that, continually ask ourselves what's not working, how do we change, um, to create a, a model, for at least for us, that works for us, for our company, to where we can make that impact that we want to make. That's great. I, I love that. that we, you said we thrive on failure before the product gets out to the public. I think that's something we should all embrace. I love that. Um, so next, let's go into more specific questions for, for each of you. Uh, Cindy, let's start with you. So as I mentioned earlier, and we've talked about, um, I think there are, in my perspective, there are a lot of nonprofits that won't admit that they failed because they're afraid their funder won't give them more money, and that it doesn't it doesn't look good on the, it doesn't spot a, a place a good spotlight on the organization. Um, I think we're starting to learn something, but how did you, how has your uh, frankness in talking about failure affected your relationship with funders? Thankfully, it's been really good. But I think um, we have a value of being incredibly transparent, and I'll give three examples. So the first is in Nepal, where we had a situation where we were working with a local partner. We discovered some financial irregularities, we'll call them, maybe a little conflict of interest with the country director, and we had to make swift action to remediate that. We told our donors immediately, we conducted a full audit. Um, there were ramifications. We had to put the program on hold, the funding on hold, um, and it was about half a million dollars in total. But because of the way that we handled the situation with such transparency, those donors stayed with us and they came back and they resumed their funding once we were able to show that we had taken the right steps to make sure that everything was in order. And that involved setting up a separate international NGO to have oversight of the local partner. I won't go into the details, but I mean, it was just really a great lesson um, and a great example that these folks were behind us and that they understood. I mean, corruption is something that happens. You've seen the Global Transparency, Transparency Index. It's, it's not great everywhere, like Nepal. Um, so that's example one. The second example I touched on earlier is just sanitation. When we started piloting, we didn't know what we were doing entirely. We had some really great theories. Um, we had a, a framework, but found, again, that, as I mentioned, the materials weren't high enough quality. You know, we, we copied a little bit of what other people were doing, and that included one example is, is uh, bathroom doors. So a lot of people have corrugated iron, and you think of like those corrugated roofs where the metals like stainless steel and or steel. Um, 
and you know they get rusty in a humid wet environment and um, that's not good when children are opening them with their little soft hands and so we switched to a much higher cost totally durable very safe pvc door and we're really excited about that but that's been this whole conversation with donors of saying you know this isn't working what we really need is x will you partner with us and help us do this so failure has been a great talking and a way to deepen the relationship. Um, the third one, I think, is flipping this question on its head a little bit and talking about systems change. So in this case, Splash has had a very school project or project by project approach. And that's not because that's what we wanted. We've always said 100% coverage of a given geography. But honestly, money is what that requires. And so um, we have this funder, the Conrad and Helton Foundation, who funds Safe Water. And they have really encouraged us to take a systems change approach. Now, I want to ask the audience, um, who has heard of systems change in the wash sector? Who can define systems change in the wash sector? I, I can't do it very well, but the Hilton Foundation has made this effort where at least they're looking at who are they. It's important to understand the key players. It's not just thinking like, about the school or the hospital or the household, but it's thinking about the government, um, civil society, so incorporating their needs, the private sector, which for us is like the supply chain of materials that we use, and then funders as well. And then thinking also about how does information flow, how do resources flow, and ultimately who is accountable. So when we put in all this wonderful infrastructure and teach the teachers and teach the kids, um, ultimately, it's actually the government that's accountable. It's a government school. So we really need to be targeting the government. So it's encouraged us. The Hilton Foundation used to just fund a bunch of schools. And the second grant, they're like, nope, we really want you to focus on systems change. We want you to develop a local supply chain, um, improve your government advocacy, actually embed staff into the government ministries to ensure coordination. Um, and, and just to take this broader approach. So that's been really, really powerful for us. So in a way, they're helping us avoid the failure of the project by project approach. That's great, thank you, Cindy. And, and I would say that it, Splash actually has a reputation, especially in Seattle and probably outside of, of that transparency that Cindy just talked about, especially with their funders. When I first met Eric Stowe, I was uh, a little surprised at how unfiltered he is when he talks about his failures and about uh, Splash in general. So it's very refreshing to hear that from a nonprofit perspective. Um, Kirk, yep. for, for you, and you mentioned this, you work with partners and that's how you uh, implement your work and that uh, you have learned at Water First that uh, a system of piped water systems to households and others community-led projects um, are sustainable. And that's what we're talking about in general, uh, how to create clean water systems that are sustainable. So how did you come about that approach? And, and can you tell us more? Yeah, and we're going to focus on, on our, our work in Ethiopia and what we learned over the process of working with a partner for 15 years, um, and, and how that pushed us towards household water supply. So um, I'll start out with, um, this is a chart from 2003. It's information dating back into the 1990s. And what does it take to achieve what we're trying to achieve? And that is, let me see if I can find which one. Okay. That is dealing with the health problems that are occurring in these communities. How do you take um, a community from being in the very high health concern, health risk category to low or very low? And, um, and We've known for a long time that you need to have water delivered to within 100 meters, five minutes total collection time to the house. Or if you want to get to this level, very low, 100 liters per person per day, you need to have uh, something at the house. All right. So, so this is old information. This was available to us, um, and it also can be presented in this graph, which is makes sense. The um, further you are or the longer it takes to gather your water, then the less water you're going to use. Um, and, and the number we're shooting for is at least 50, ideally up around 100. So in Ethiopia, um, you know, we start in communities where this is how they're collecting their water and this is the quality of the water that they're using. 
And there are a variety of interventions or approaches you can take to help that community out. You could build a hand pump, but generally these hand pumps are not going to get you close enough or get that time to the water and back down low enough to reach your goal. So we always worked with our partner on the um, on the public taps. Let's let's have a large well. Let's pump water to a big tank, and then let's supply all these public tanks. Uh, taps around um, the community, maybe 10 of them, so that they've got a short distance to walk. So then in our monitoring, um, we found that we weren't getting anywhere close to that 50 liters per day that we were supposed to get to. And, um, and, and actually, we should have known that. Because if you look carefully at this graph, right Steve? <laughs> that's a really steep curve, all right? And that 50, that 50 is not at five minutes. And that's just, that's just barely getting where we want to be. So we really, um, we were doing these, these uh, community taps, not because it was the best idea, not because it was best practices. Um, it was primarily, I think, a budgetary reason that uh, one of those projects costs $200,000, and we were a young organization, and, and we didn't have $300,000 to contribute to that project, which is what it would have taken to do household connections. But you know, in our, in our current projects, because they are uh, piped water systems, well, all these families are paying, these are poor families, they're paying to uh, have their own connection to the system. There are probably 15 households in this community, Colegio Garvey, there are 10 in another. There are three different communities where some families have paid, and they all have meters because they have to pay for the water by the quantity that they use. And guess what? They're using just the amount that we want them to use. <laughs> They're using about 50 to 75 liters per person per day. Like, ah! Should have been doing this from the start. Why did we, why did we wait so long to do these household connections? So you know, our newest project, uh, we are piping the water to everyone's house. We're skipping the, um, the tap attendants and the public water stands. We're just pay a little extra, and and that's going to pay off in in days. I mean, when when you save every household in a community 15 minutes a day in collection time. What is the extra $100,000 that you spent on the project? When you sell five times more water than you would if, if you built a system that had um, public taps, then that extra cost is recouped easily in the first year. So that's one of the adjustments we made, and, and that's why it's important to visit these projects and really measure what your outcomes are and when you see something popping up, measure that and figure out what's going on on the side. And, and if it's working, then, then copy it, do it. That's great. Thank you. And um, it may have taken you a while, but Water First is so good at listening to the community, working with the partners there, and figuring out what works. So it's a great example. Um, so, Patrick, from your more private sector perspective, uh, what is it like to do innovation, R&D, or global development work? Hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really hard because that, you know, it's a, it's a new space and it's very different. Um, and we're designing products for people that aren't ourselves. And so it's, it's very different. In the outdoor community, I mean, we all, we're our own customers. And so we know what we want. We know what needs to happen, but to try to think of what somebody in a rural village halfway around the world needs is uh, is very different. And so in order to do that successfully, we need good partners, we need to go to the field, we need to really think about user-centered design, um, but in a completely different context that we do in our in our normal business. Um, and so it's, it's really challenging, I think, in a lot of ways to figure out how do we do this in a way that's going to be sustainable, allow us to scale, um, and be successful as a as a for profit company? We have you know different constraints. I think working uh, in the space, and we have to make sure that our 
um, that our owners are happy with the work that we're doing and that we're able to, you know, at some point return a profit. Um, so there's a lot of different things that we work with that, um, you know, make it really challenging versus maybe a startup that's starting in this space. So being a, a, a company that's trying to just kind of step over into the space, it is, it's really difficult. Um, but I think, you know, one of the key factors for us has always been partnerships. We can't do this on our own, um, and we don't want to. We want to keep our keep to our core competency and understand that we know how to design and engineer and manufacture products and make products manufacturable, um, but work with others to figure out how do we actually reach the beneficiaries of, of those, how do we um, make sure that we can do these at low cost. Some of our products that, uh, we have a hand washing station that's back there that we designed that we don't really think we're going to make a lot of money on. It's going to be mostly open source, let other people manufacture it. Um, and so there's you know lots of different things that we have to think about uh, in the space. And if we're spending a lot of money that then is just going to give these things away, then um, you know our uh, the people that control our purse strings aren't necessarily happy. So it can be really um, challenging from those perspectives. But I think having those those partners and those partners that have our our back in this as well. Um, is really important, and I think for us, you know, we started out targeting kind of NGOs as our uh, as our customer, and as we've gone along, you know, the, the thought has always kind of been, I think, the way that a lot of people think, and that's that these, you know, the people in the developing world need help, and these NGOs are there to help them, and that's not untrue. But we've tried to shift our mindset to. These are people that are our customers, and so if we can design and think about that in a way that how do we reach this customer for what they need at the price that they need, um, then I think we can create a sustainable system around that that allows us to be successful and allows us to reach the people that we want to reach. And that sounds like what Kirk was saying as well, and really learning the end user. I think it's, it's throughout this conversation. So. Uh, that's great. So I have one more question, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, Global Washington this year is looking at what we're calling wicked problems, what other people call wicked problems as well, but looking at problems that are so complex that there's no one solution that will fix it, that we need really comprehensive solutions, and that's what you've heard here today. Again, even Slash's evolution of, of really looking at hygiene as it comes, uh, as it relates to water and getting into menstrual health. So we're looking at the wicked problems um, in each of our issue campaigns and that will roll up into our annual conference that we have on December 5th here in Seattle. So uh, my last question for all of you is around this, what is it going to take to solve these wicked problems as it relates to clean water? And also, are you optimistic about the future? Uh, Cindy, why don't you I am super optimistic, but to go back to the first question, what will it take? I think it will take money. But I'm a fundraiser, so that's the first <laughs> thing that I think about. But not just any money. We need multi-year funding. We need unrestricted funding that allows for innovation. We need donors to understand the importance of failure, just like any investor in a tech company understands you have to fail and fail again to get it right, and that it's natural and it's actually positive. But I'm going to tell you a success story. So I started out talking about how we've learned from failure. Um, and then I went to how we're so transparent about failure. But here's where it's all going to come together. All that failure amounting to 1 million kids having water, sanitation, hygiene, and menstrual health support. So I want to tell you a little bit about Project WISE, or Washington Schools for Everyone. And that is our effort to reach every kid at a government school in Addis Ababa and Kolkata with WASH and menstrual health services, reaching 1 million kids. And this is where I see a real success story for how funding can help solve this wicked problem. Check out how many funders are involved in this coalition. But that didn't just happen. By itself, we had one anchor funder, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, come in with $19 million against a $44 million budget and say, we want to do this. Now, when they did that, it helped us. We had other funders that were interested, but it really helped seal the deal. It helped increase some grant sizes. So um, it's pretty exciting. So I just wanted to share a little bit about this project. This is our theory of change. So maybe just looking at the interventions, we're going to improve WASH infrastructure, we're going to promote WASH behavior change here, and strengthen school-based menstrual health programs. I won't go into the middle, but ultimately our goal is for these outcomes, students are healthier, 
and that they increase school attendance, especially for girls. But the great thing about this project is the bottom here, the other things we're doing to ensure that this is successful, if you can't see it from the back, it's fosters sustainability through local ownership by schools and governments, and then lay the foundation for replication in other cities. So we know we haven't succeeded if we just do this in two cities. Why not take it global, at least to the low resource cities where our intervention is appropriate? And so this are just a couple of the ways that we're addressing um, sustainability in our approach, but just wanted to kind of um, take you to, towards the middle of the journey where we figured out so many things that we need to do beyond just that middle column of like the water, the sanitation, and the hygiene at the school. And some of the key points, I think one of my favorites is this idea of operating at a citywide or district level approach. That's something that's gotten a lot of, um, a lot of interest and has had some great groups adopt that model. One of them is Hilton, I believe WaterAid, IRC, um, are really looking at that way because that way you're getting the, the lowest level of the government elected government officials on board. They're the ones that are closest to the community and they are ultimately accountable for whether the services are working in their zone of influence. Um, obviously use robust hardware, we talked about that. And then really just getting co-investment um, by schools and governments and having you know, a clear MOU that outlines roles and responsibilities. Um, one thing we learned was you should not just promise five years of support. You've got to start them off high and then low, but you've got to bring them along in that journey and not say, here's five years of support and in year six, good luck. You're on your own. And so when I started my remarks, I told you our tagline, clean water for kids. And now this is not a finished product, but this is what we're looking at and it's really different. It splash delivers child focused water sanitation, hygiene and menstrual health, it's quite, quite a mouthful, programs for governments. Because ultimately that is the end customer and that's how we think we're gonna solve this wicked problem and ensure that our work is sustainable. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, I think there there are a number of reasons to be optimistic, and the first is that this is a solvable problem. We're not searching for a solution. The solution is there. We are living it, using it every day. And as a matter of fact, you know, two thirds of the world is practicing that the head gets clean water has access to toilets every day so it's just the third that don't and uh, and so the the amount of money needed is is actually um, it's it seems big but it's not insurmountable it's less per year than we spend on beer it's less per year than we spend on chips it's less per year than we spend on video games so, I mean, if you take a little bit from each of those things, we can do this. You know, that's, that's doable. <laughs> and then you just taxes the men. <laughs> so, um, and, and the other thing is, um, you know, we've been um, engaging kids recently with youth boards and we've got a mid-school board we've got a high school board and they get it you know you walk into a school and you make a presentation to kids and 15 sign up and now they'll be walking next weekend at carry five walk for water at seattle center and that event has gone from a low hundred thousand four years ago to, you know, it might hit two fifty, three hundred thousand dollars this year. So it just poof, is is growing and these young people are driving it and they're the ones who are gonna step into our shoes. And I think they have more of a global perspective, they have more of a justice and fairness perspective. Um, and and I think the challenge is our generation has to get it done before they do and say, ah, look, that wasn't so hard. And then we're embarrassed about what we didn't accomplish. So um, so I am, I'm optimistic. I think this can be done. Uh, the, other, the other thing is uh, you know, we, we talk every once in a while about Charity Water. I don't know if folks are familiar with Charity Water, but it's a, it's a big organization in New York City that is really good at, at marketing and 
they they raise like they're going to raise sixty million dollars this year. I didn't hear from someday. So I mean, and and their message is based on hey, it feels good to do the right thing. So you know, it's it's working. There there are organizations out there who are reaching the masses and getting them to participate in this and and to come back and participate again a year later at their birthday. So uh, things are moving, and and I think it's going in the right direction. I'm optimistic. <laughs> My wife calls me psychotically optimistic, so I'll say yes, I'm optimistic. Um, I, I, I think it, it takes a lot of this, of talking about failure and coming together from people from every part of the sector to understand what everybody's doing, what the challenges are. Um, and then it takes thinking outside of the box a little bit and being innovative, not just you know not just in products, but in um, you know I think what Splash is doing is really innovative in thinking of uh, targeting the governments in that way. And um, there's just there's a lot of innovation I think still to be had. Um, and I think the just the pace of technology and and things that I can't even wrap my brain around in AI and all sorts of things. Um, will help propel a lot of this, uh, a lot of this change and innovation forward um, a lot more quickly. I feel like things have been, you know, progressing and getting better, but the rate at which they're getting better seems to be picking up um, quite a bit, which is really exciting. And I think that looking, starting to look at, um, as I mentioned before, starting to look at these people as customers has really. Um, help shift the way some of these problems are tackled and I think you saw that a lot in like solar definitely and being able to go to individual households and understand how you can install solar systems in a way that the company that's installing them can make money the people that uh, can benefit from them and that you don't need this huge amount of money for infrastructure to be able to reach people um, and, uh, and cell phones and, and other things like that I think it really leapfrogged um, forward in, in terms of innovation and I think within WASH we're starting to finally see that um, and I think it, it, it lastly it also takes kind of the, the moonshot ideas and, and everybody plowing towards um, that same uh, objective I think you know the sanitation you see a lot of that with the toilet of the future you know a couple of years ago we were asked to um, start working on some sanitation technologies and we were kind of thinking that this was so far off in the future um, and now we have prototypes being fielded in, in, in India um, and hopefully we'll be installing a, a, a unit for field trials at a national park uh, here in the near future as well. So um, things that we couldn't even imagine um, a couple of years ago even really being actual products or things coming to life um, have been able to do so because of the, the emphasis behind them, the money that people are putting behind them to help us develop these technologies and move things forward. Um, and so I think all of those things coming together, and again, like I said, just everybody coming together to talk about the failures and what's working and what's not, uh, and understanding that uh, we need to constantly think about how we're doing things and how we need to change and how we're gonna get to where we wanna go. Um, but I'm definitely optimistic that we'll get there. So great, I think that was the most optimistic gotten so far this year from one of our panels so <laughs> thank you so much and I think um, this is probably doesn't need to be said but this can be applied to not just clean water right this can be applied to global health or access to finance or whatever uh, intervention that you can think of for global development we need to get better at talking about failure and learning from each other iterating partnering so this has been so great. So we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. Donnie will come around. We have a microphone here. I just ask if you would introduce yourself in affiliation if you'd like. And uh, if you can, direct the question to one of the panelists um, so that we can get more questions. Go ahead. I just have a question. I'm, I'm from Lake Union Rotary, and we work, uh, have worked with Splash, not me in particular. But I have a question as I, you know, I, I first of all recognize how important it is to get to the kids for the education. But when I hear the um, experience in the rural and the urban areas, it seems like we're making the same mistake in the urban area that we've already done in the rural area. We're, we're basically creating a well someplace where everybody has to go, but 
the kids have to go home afterwards to a, a house where the water isn't safe or may not be safe. Um, so are we really accomplishing that much? Um, and, and do we see an outcome with the decrease in um, waterborne illness in the community by just going to the school um, and, and supplying water there? We do see a decrease in waterborne illness at the school level, and that's ultimately what we're trying to accomplish first. So the infrastructure that we put in at the school, it's not a well, it's actually taking from municipal water and using ultrafiltration systems, uh, which are not that large. They're like the size of a suitcase that you hang on a wall, plumb into the plumbing, and it produces beautiful, clean, safe water. Uh, but it's a really great question and one that we just got today from a prospective donor. And one point is that uh, we've actually done research, for example, in Kolkata and the water quality at households in two neighborhoods that we tested, one a slum community and one a low income settlement, was actually very high. So contamination occurs not necessarily at the, you know, at the municipal water supply source. They're doing a great job. It's clean. It's what happens on the way from the municipal water supply. It can get contaminated in the pipes, even in the taps or in the storage units at the school. So it really is important to operate at the school level. The kids are there eight hours a day, over 200 days a year. Um, and any incremental exposure, just like if you keep eating poisoned food, where it will cause food poisoning, you keep getting problems I won't talk about. Um, every time you get, you're drinking the dirty water, you're exposed to that illness. So that's what we're trying to prevent. And I've also heard Splash talk about in their wash, their education, the, the children actually become advocates to their parents, right? They learn at school and um, bring that home in, the, in that great school community there. That's a really good question. Um, I also wanted to mention, if you have questions for Serena, she's here too and can answer questions as well. Other questions? Is it on? Hi. Wait. It'll modulate to your voice. So oh, okay. Um, okay. Hi, I'm Rihanna. I'm also from the Lake Union Rotary Club. Um, I guess I had a question for Kirk. I was. You said that they pay for the metered water. How would you tackle problems in communities and countries where they're not actually paying for water at a certain level? Like I know, like I think it's a the European system where they don't they don't pay up until they pass a certain level. How would you like? focus on the change where they have to start paying for water now and that's the way they haven't done before. Um, so in in all of our projects, in all of our countries, users pay for the water that they're using and then that becomes a resource for them to uh, fix something that's broken or um, or save it up to you know, future, or pay someone uh, who may be running the system. Um, one of our measures of whether or not a project is successful is is everyone paying a water bill within a community uh, that community can decide uh, this household here won't have to pay a water bill because it's it's usually a widow who's living alone and doesn't have income is not going to use that much water uh, the community uh, raises their rate individual rate to cover the cost of a few people within that community who can't who really can't pay. But um, even in the poorest communities that we serve, people have money to pay for water, and they're willing to pay for it. Uh, so uh, that is a, that's, uh, sometimes I think people are concerned that, oh, you're charging poor people uh, for water, and, and they don't have, you know, they don't make that much money. They're not meeting all their needs. If they pay for that water, then that water uh, resource is something that they can rely on in the future, and it's something that is going to drive them forward as a community because now they can spend more time working, they can grow more crops, they can sell that crops. So it's it's actually an investment. By paying for the water, they get it back. And convincing a community that that process is going to happen um, is part of the challenge of being a good partner to us. Right. And, and that's what our partners are good at. And when you get to a, a country like um, like Honduras, they don't have to convince anyone anymore because they've been working in that region for 30 years and there are 250 projects that are working and all those communities are doing great. So the rest of the communities just have their name on the list and they're waiting for their time to come and they're gonna be happily pay the water bill. So. 
water bills are an important part of every water project. Hi, my name is Lois Ongudi, and I'm a founder and executive director of a non-for-profit. And I have two quick questions. One uh, for Cindy. And I saw you show us some plastic, colorful buckets for washing hands. And immediately, I just started thinking about biodegradable and something that is being created that is no longer being consumed by the soil. And so um, I'm just wondering if an, an alternative or something better has been thought through. Example, Kenya, they are really against now working hard for plastics and things which are plastics. And so that struck me as uh, something interesting. Then I saw that there was something like cemented uh, alternatives. And that's something we've done. So I just thought of asking that. Can I ask a second question, please? And uh, we are also building schools and supporting women. And we have some of the projects that you're working on. And in fact, my question for you is, for example, for us, for you to get water, you've got to go to a source where water is. So you either have a pump and have electricity or something to that effect. So for us, it forced us to start with cistern tanks because we couldn't afford to dig many wells and there's no way of paying electricity. How do you uh, supply water and who pays for electricity if need be, if you do do the su supply of water to different homes? So the, um, the electricity or, or the diesel fuel that powers the pump, uh, that is paid for by a water committee and the water committee uses the, the monthly water fees to pay for for that bill, um, and, and usually that comes out to be two dollars or so per household to cover operational costs. But they should pay a little bit more than that. They need to figure out well, we don't want to just break even. We want to start generating savings. So part of the the process is figuring out what are your what are your fixed costs. What are your operational costs, and how much money do you want to save in order to remain a, um, a, a viable institution over time? Um, so it's it's the users who, who pay for for those um, pumps and, and operating those pumps, and, and the money's there. They're they're buying cell phone minutes, and this is just as important to them as as those cell phone minutes. So they'll pay for it if they're getting a good service. Yeah, in terms of the stations, I mean, my understanding of biodegradable is something that is not durable because it would lose form and go back into the earth. So that's not, we're looking for durable products that can last decades. So we think that the plastic stations that are made from recycled plastic and they themselves can be recyclable are not only going to last decades, but they're light years ahead of concrete, which is actually extremely environmentally harmful in terms of the carbon emissions and the fact that that thing, it just sits there forever. It's actually very expensive to try to remove an ugly concrete hand washing station. Does that answer your question? I'd like to disagree, but... I we may disagree on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Respectfully so, I'd like to of disagree. Course. Yeah, I would be happy to discuss for So we'll discuss it outside this forum. Mm -hmm. Good. Other questions? Can I? Hi, my name is Wesson. So my question for you, Serena. Um, I know you're talking about the um, you're talking about the the weaknesses, the failures. I think that will be uh, very important in terms of you know for the organization who are already working in the sanitation work. But are those um, written or are there reports or evidence? I said evidence, you know. Uh, to access and then uh, be able to learn something from it. Um, yeah, a quick answer is yes. I think that all of us, um, all the organizations here have a lot of information on our websites. That, and on, on, in WaterAid's case, we publish our evaluations and we publish also reports, sometimes thematic reports, so around there might be a report around um, equity and inclusion, for example. Are we really reaching everybody in the community? Or around water safety 
and others. And um, I think also the periodic conferences that happen in the WASH sector, there's a lot of really great information at the UNC conference is one example in the US that um, there's a lot of research being disseminated and reports but happy to also connect um, outside of this if, there, if you have specific areas that you're interested in. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Perdus Amiza from Spriha Foundation, and uh, we work in Bangladesh in the Islam community. So my question is for Kirk and also Cindy. So the question is that um, the slum, uh, one of our projects is in the slum and this community. Um, so we have slum lords who rent these rooms to the, um, the tenants. And sometimes they steal the water line from the municipal authority and they would charge more to the tenants. So actually this, the slum dwellers, they're actually paying more for the water. So my question to you is that do you get into this this issues and how do you resolve that? And at the same time, how do you maintain the water quality that they're they're getting? Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> so that is that's an issue then that you know we rely on our partner organizations to address, and um, our partner in Bangladesh is DSK, and they've done um, they've done an excellent job dealing with this issue. Um, primarily, so um, they've done it two ways. One is to get a legal connection from the, from the DACA Water and Sewer Authority to, to actually connect their, their compound up to the, the um, water supply line. So that means they don't have to rely on, on someone who's, um, who's cutting a line somewhere and stealing water and then reselling it. <clears throat> um, up until 10 years ago, it was it, uh, it was not legal to have a connection if you were a slum community, but DSK actually worked with the government to get that changed, initially by taking out the, um, uh, the, the ownership of the connection themselves and being the guarantor, although the community was paying for it. Um, and then over time, the repayment rate was so good and DSK didn't have to get involved, that the government said, okay, we accept this, uh, this form of doing business and we will give connections to, um, to community groups that come to us and ask for a connection. So you are, are able to make a connection with Dwasa Water and Sewer Authority um, legally now in Bangladesh. And it's something that, you, that your groups might wanna pursue because you don't have to go through a middle person, you pay the Dwasa rate. Um, but we also found that uh, our projects aren't using the municipal water supply very much um, because it's not, a, it's not very reliable and it's not clean. So the other option that our partner offers is that they can, um, they'll dig a well right there in their own compound and so that's what is usually happening. They have their own well and they, they're paying for the cost of operating a well. But we're trying to get them away from that towards maybe more of a community system. So there, there, it, what I say when we go to Bangladesh is let's start off with the understanding that it's complicated and, and then let's talk through the, the situation and, and figure out a, a solution from there. But I, I think you have a couple options. Um, and one is going directly to Dwasa and getting a connection. And, and hopefully you're in a, an area where uh, they have fairly reliable water supply and, and and it stays fairly clean, but that's not, that, that's a tough, <laughs> that's not, how often does that happen, Steve? Right. Steve is uh, is here in the front row, so I, he does a lot of our monitoring, um, so I'll, you can ask him questions too. <laughs> Hi, I'm David Albert from the Friendly Water for the World. Thank you, thank you so much for you know, I'm very optimistic about your work. I'm very optimistic because I hear about your failures and what you're doing to correct them. I know we have exactly the same things going on. I'm less optimistic about what's happening in the world, um, specifically around water. And I'm even less optimistic that we're getting good data. I've worked in India for 42 years. The water, that is one of the richest countries on Earth. 
the water is much, much, much worse than it was 42 years ago. 21% of the population has cognitive deficits caused by parasitic stress. It's caused, called the largest brain drain in the history of the world going on right now in India. There's a state in India, Gujarat, there's not a single river, potable river in the entire state. Sanitation is worse. Availability of water is worse. Climate, people are now in areas that I used to work in northern Karnataka, um, where the people used to use ponds and streams. They're now bringing water up from 1,000, 1,500 feet deep, and the fluorosis is common among children. It's, it's everyone expects your child to have fluorosis. It's, it's, it's not, and there's, there, there is no attempt to deal with it whatsoever. I also know from working with doctors in India that reportable conditions of waterborne illnesses are not accurate. In the areas that I specifically work, and I know a lot of doctors, they won't report a case of cholera. They won't report a case of typhoid. And the reason is, is because they've been told by public health officials not to. The reason for that is because the public health data will then go to the state and the central government and they'll expect the state and central government to do something about it. And so they have literally been told, when you have one of those cases, don't come to us. So when I read World Health Organization data sets, I'm always looking for the fine print. It usually comes from Sentinel hospitals. Sentinel hospitals are not where people go for their health care. And this is true, I, I know this is true in Africa too, because we work in Africa too. And I'm seeing the same case in many of the East and Central African countries that I'm, I'm working in. People will tell you, oh, we used to drink out of this river all the time, and rarely people got sick. Now we don't touch it. Water table is sinking everywhere. I would love to see, this is something for uh, Global Washington, an evaluation of failures on a large scale. Because your organizations and my organization are doing wonderful, wonderful work and getting better at it all the time. But in a global scheme, I have my doubts. Yeah, David, you bring up a really good point. I know, um, Cindy, you had Tableau as part of your partners, is that right, too? And I know Tableau is, is, is pushing organizations to be more data-driven, and I'm, I'm sure all of you are looking at this. But Cindy, do you want to talk about the, if you're using data to inform your programs or what you think that looks like? Yeah, I think one hundred percent. But right now, we're really focused on the data around our specific intervention. So we are looking in the future to pull in bigger data sets and understand the macro level. But there's so much work that's being done already around the SDGs, or looking at other organizations like the Nature Conservancy that is looking at more of what is the health of the ecosystem. I think part of the solution is for groups to be more aligned and in conversation with one another, so that. You know, Slash is does doing something very specific, but we rely on much bigger, uh, much bigger ecosystem level health in order for our little but effective intervention sure. to work. So um, having that dialogue, I don't think there's a dearth of data. There might be a dearth of, of accurate data, but still, like the data shows that there's millions upwards of billions of people without water and sanitation. So I think we know that that's a problem. We know the climate change, most of us, that it's a problem. Um, so I'm not sure that data is the ultimate problem. Well, and, and David, we are at Global Washington looking at a 10-year project around the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and looking at working with our members to help them track their own progress to the SDGs, and then Global Washington would be a dashboard for all of that to roll up so that we would have a meta picture around that. Um, that's going to take time to do, and we're just even starting with Microsoft in terms of looking at data standardization around what it takes for our members to track and, and how to map what they do to the SDGs. We have several, maybe your work that goes specifically to one of the SDGs, number six, but there's so many that are cross-cutting too, and that's where we need to work. That's what the, we all talk about in partnership. We all need to figure out how to get to those 169 targets within the SDGs and all move forward around that. So it, it's a lot of work, but really important to do. Um, we have time for one or two more questions, I think, too. Okay, the back row is getting a lot of questions here. I'll be brief, sorry. I, first of all, I want to say this 
topic is so encouraging to me. It gives me optimism. I'm Brian Gower from World Vision. We're close with Patrick and Serena, so I'm good to, it's neat to be with my peers in the WASH space. My question that really sparked my interest was when Cindy, um, and I know Eric and what Splash is doing, was talking about clear examples of failure around the filtration systems and around the hand washing stations and around toilets. And um, World Vision has learned over the years this whole issue about, we're still learning about not being afraid, about being transparent with the donor. And from the get-go, we've done some innovative products in the past where we don't spend our donor funds on R&D, so we rely upon groups like Patrick uh, to do some really good R&D, and then we take that and we test that into the field. But in this particular case, we, we thought we had a good product for uh, drilling. It was a new technology for drilling. We had another donor come alongside. I don't know if there was such transparent communication to the donor at the very beginning, Cindy, from the standpoint of like there could be failure. So we failed. We told the donor, and the donor was like, well, you're not going to get any more money for us. You need to go finish it and do it right. So then we were like, what do we do? We had to go find some reserves. And I didn't know in your methodology with all the failures that you described, does Splash have the special hidden fund, <laughs> the failure fund, that I need to know about? <laughs> so. No, <laughs> but now I'm thinking about creating one. Um, but I liked your point around, do we tell the donors up front? I do think we describe when we're doing something new that it's a pilot, it's an opportunity for us to learn and, and innovation. I don't know if we specifically say, and we might fail, but we should, and I wouldn't be afraid to say that. I think we have developed partnerships, especially the longer term ones, where they know that's part of the deal, and they're counting on us to try something and ultimately come up with something amazing. So I'm going to think about that. Good. And there is at least one foundation I know that funds organizations that are um, that hit a roadblock. It's the Open Road. Open Road. And it, it, you have to be very specific with them that it is, you know, if, if a hurricane hits the country and you're trying to implement a project and it's, it's impossible, you don't have the reserve to fill your fund to, to tap into. So, and uh, there is a movement, I think, in funders of, of really working more in partnership with the nonprofit and, and really thinking through what that looks like. So, um, I, I'm hopeful, I think, for the changes for funders in that relationship, too. It's a good question. Uh, we do have time for another question. I wanted to find out if anybody has looked into system tanks, because uh, in communities in the developing world, let me talk about Kenya where I'm working now, when they can't afford to drill a uh, borehole, and more and more people now have corrugated iron sheets, there are so many people who are doing system tanks, excluding ourselves. We did underground system tank just this past year, 2017, which we put four 10,000 liters water tanks underneath, and then we, we have reservoir tanks up, and then we are using that to distribute water. We are depending on rainwater, because we built a building with large roof, and uh, there are more and more people who are putting system tanks now, and they don't might not have enough compound to put it with the underneath or something. If there's anybody who has some information about that, or funds that kind of a, a system, that would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Eric. Thank you. I think we're going to end there, um, but I, what I wanted to say too is that we are recording this for our, um, our own purposes, but we're going to post this event on our website, so if there are people here, the people you know that couldn't make it here today, uh, we'll send you the link around, and again, we have this issue brief here, and then we also have um, two interviews. We, as I mentioned, Global Washington is embarking on an SDG initiative, so we are interviewing one person each month around a topic that we're calling the goal makers, because the SDG in the UN has the, the goal keepers, and we believe the nonprofits and for profits doing the work are the goal makers. So Kirk is our goal maker for this month, um, and looking at, at other organizations throughout the year and individuals. So I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. If you haven't already, we do events at least once a month, usually about four times, four events per month on different topics. So um, 
stay in touch. And, they, and then we have our displays here for, um, for you all to look through and uh, talk with all the organizations. The organizations that are here with displays are Friendly Water for, uh, for the World and MSR. Path from Poverty is also here with a display. Splash, Water First, and Water Aid. So I encourage all of you to spend some time speaking with our panelists and other members here. So please join me in thanking our panelists for that.